So, um, I culled this uh, talk while uh, Dr. Sanders was uh, making his presentation, and uh, basically what we were trying to do was uh, looking at the scope from the pulmonary veins through to quadratriatum, through supravalvar mitral rings, uh, through double uh, orifices, clefts, and accessory tissues. And the one thing that I've discovered about looking at mitral valve abnormalities is very often there's not just one. There are often more than one. So you can have a patient with, uh, you know, a mitral stenosis with a supravalvar ring, and there may be an accessory orifice here, there, or in, and I really, in trying to separate them out when I really did my original uh, uh, study on mitral valves with Arnie Banerjee, it wasn't possible to separate them out, and it's even more difficult to present them because if you want to present cleft valves, you're also talking about uh, uh, congenital mitral stenosis. And uh, you start off repeating yourself, and, and it's very difficult to get there. I mean, I think that's why a segmental approach to the valve is so yeah. important. Right. Um, I agree. I thought your presentation was perfectly classified. It really made it crystal clear to me. So, uh, subaortic narrowing, fibrous subaortic ridge. I was going to discuss straddling valves, but I really think that it's out of the purview of today's uh, signal. So, we're discussing it elsewhere. So, now, pulmonary vein stenosis is a variety of causes now. And I think that the fact that we have surgeons that are doing surgery, and if you think of the heart, what holds the heart in the chest? It's the veins, the pulmonary veins and the systemic veins. And if the surgeon perhaps changes the position of the heart in the chest by surgery, if the heart is stuck on the veins, you can kink the veins. And we've seen this a number of times. This is a stenosis of the left pulmonary veins. Uh, sometimes uh, if it goes on for a, a fairly long period of time, as you can see in the bottom, the vein is actually tiny, um, becomes extremely small. Here um, is a patient at the time of surgery. This is a transesophageal echo. We found this uh, uh, on the surface echo. And you can see here comes the uh, left pulmonary vein. And at the point where it joins the atrium, you can see how absolutely narrow it is. Tiny area there. So watch out for that because I think that um, we, uh, we've seen many of them and not recognized them. Uh, there are all kinds of pexies that the surgeon are doing for the aorta and the pulmonary artery and so on and so forth. And this is just another area that we have to think of. Uh, this is really the only kind of pulmonary vein I'm really very expert with talking about. As Dr. Nader said, as far as the others, I've seen less than 100 of each kind. So uh, I think that they're very, uh, it's, it's easy to see. Here's the Doppler flow signal. And clearly this is preoperative. And here's post-operative after the surgeon has actually resected some of this tissue here in between the pulmonary vein and the atrium. And you can see the velocity signal has changed. We actually have a better angle for us of the position of the heart. And the Doppler has gone down from a mean velocity of about uh, 16, uh, what do we get here? 13.6 meters per second to a really much more normal pulmonary venous Doppler signal. <clears throat> Now, Steve mentioned something about quadratriatum. I've seen very few uh, pathological specimens because we're lucky enough now uh, that uh, we recognize most of them before they're born, uh, before they uh, die, and uh, we fix them. So here's an example of quadratriatum, and this is probably the classical description. This is the pulmonary venous confluence, and you can see all four pulmonary veins are draining into this. The atrial appendage here is always in... Um, uh, quarter atriatum, distal or proximal, to, uh, the, uh, it's closer to the mitral valve than the membrane. So uh, if you can follow this up and you find that you're seeing the true part of the left atrium over here, this is the part where the pulmonary veins co uh, coalesce and, conf uh, and join uh, to the left atrium and what's left behind is an incomplete um, uh, structure. The membrane itself is very interesting because it's not really a membrane. Sometimes it's got cartilage in it and can be very thick and fibrous as well. So it's, uh, it's an interesting structure. And, uh, Usually muscular. Yeah. Um, and muscle. 
the, the position of the palmary veins is, uh, is variable. Some of the times the palmary veins drain um, up, uh, all, all of the palmary veins drain into the chamber, sometimes they don't, sometimes there's an ASD, I've seen them where there's an atrial septal defect, the veins decompress into the left atrium and then shunt back into the right, uh, decompress into the right atrium and then shunt back into the left atrium. So here's a classical description of quarter atriatum in the long axis, and I have the membrane here, it's, I've called it a membrane. You see the uh, distal left atrium and the mitral valve, and you'll see the membrane very nicely there. And this, uh, the place where the orifice is varies from patient to patient. Sometimes it's medial, sometimes it's anterior, sometimes it's posterior, sometimes it's lateral, and this one here you can see is lateral. When we look at this uh, view here, you can see the atrial shunt here, okay? But if you look in the four-chamber view, you can see the orifice exit of this quarter atriotum, which is very, very mobile, is seen over here. Um, now, a lot of people will confuse quarter atriotum and supravalve of that ring, and I've told you how to get rid of it. But the problem with the quarter atriotum is because the pressure in the venous system is high and occurs over a long period of time, the quarter tends to grow towards the mitral valve. And so it may look to some that it's a super valve uh, ring, but it isn't really. It's a really quarter And if you didn't like that example, I have another one for you, which, which I've only seen one in my life. And this is a patient who has quarter atriotum sinistrum at dextrum. In other words, he's got four atrium and not two. Um, here is, and they have different origins, here is the quarter atriotum, here is the left atrial appendage distal to the membrane, and this is a large eustachian valve, okay, which is attaching to the septum and acting as a quarter atriotum dextrum. So here when we look at it in the four chamber view, we lose the quarter atriotum dextrum part, we can still see the quarter atriotum in, this, in the left component of the valve. So, very interesting uh, and unusual finding. More uh, interesting and unusual. Now, supravalvar rings, I'd like to just add my little bit to it. You can get isolated supravalvar rings and you can attack them at surgery, and these are two surgical examples. Um, it works much more successfully if it's only an isolated ring than when it's an isolated ring or a, it's a supravalvar ring associated with mitral valve disease. And this is sometimes what happens in, in uh, Schoen's complex, because when you deal with Schoen's complex, you've got uh, supravalvar mitral ring and you've got mitral valve abnormalities, usually with the parachute mitral valve, subaortic stenosis and coarctation. And uh, what happens in the clinical course of these patients is first they get recognized as having coarctation and a minor mitral valve abnormality, so they get their coox fixed, and then they do all right for a while, and then they get subaortic stenosis and somebody fixes the subaortic stenosis. Then they get uh, obstruction at the mitral valve level and somebody tries to relieve the obstruction and sometimes it works relatively well. And lastly, they get left with an abnormal mitral valve and eventually uh, need to undergo replacement, which is why I call it the gift that keeps on giving. Now, <clears throat> just as you can orient a specimen in an, uh, an echo plane, you can operate, or, or, orient an echocardiogram that has been wrongly recorded in an upside down position in a normal way. And so here's a patient who has a supravalva ring. And what I'd like to say about rings is that when I do pathology with my uh, group, I always make them put their fingers in the mitral valve because really what you do when you put your finger in a mitral valve is you have a ring on your finger. And I think the rings are often more intramitral than they are supramitral. Yeah. I mean, I know there are a variety, and I've seen both of them. But this is not an uncommon variety. And, it, and I looked on uh, some of the pictures. It becomes, if it gets too deep, then you can't really get to tell the difference between the tenderness cords uh, uh, at, at, the, at the orifice of the valve and where the ring is. So, yeah. Uh -huh. And then uh, I, just for my little bit here, here's uh, our uh, examples of a mitral arcade uh, recently uh, published uh, uh, from uh, fetal sections with twin-to-twin uh, -twin transfusions. Uh, that's very interesting. Twin-to-twin -twin transfusions, we know that they cause cardiac abnormalities, maybe aortic atresia, 
more frequently palmary trees here, and you look at these valves, and this is a classical example of an arcade. Now, the double orifice is uh, several kinds. There's the one where there's really a true reduplication of the orifice of the valve, and there's one also where the valve really just has a fibrous adherence in it, and then there's a rarer kind where, it's like with an AV canal, where it's usually on the annulus and somewhat distal. I don't, know, I, have, I don't have pathology in this presentation about that. But here's an example of a classical reduplication of the mitral orifice. You see an annulus here with one little valve there, and you see an annulus there with the same little valve here, and they look like this echocardiographically. You see the two orifices in that subcostal view that I've tried to match up. And here comes the color flow system. And you see the, the color flow of the two separate orifices coming directly through the valve. The medial orifice is a little bigger than the lateral orifice. And this can, often can occur uh, isolated, but can occur with other congenital heart disease. We've seen it most frequently with ventricular septal defects. We've seen it with atrial septal defects. And we've even seen a truncus. And the summary of the truncus arteriosus was this patient had four valves, but two, two were in the mitral position. Um, and this is for you, Girish. See, I can also do 3D. So this is the same patient. And um, did this play? Somebody stopped it. Oh, I'll go back and get it to play again. See, mine actually play. <laughs> You're getting none of my time, Girish. <laughs> you missed the point, Girish. Yes. The mid which doesn't oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah it, it did play, but it's not playing anymore. I especially deliberately did this, Girish, to show you that 2D echo is better. But <laughs> what, what, I, what I wanted to do is. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Well, the echo plays 2D. It's obviously better. <laughs> but uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, you still can get a really good appearance of uh, the valve. You see this little handcuff in the middle that represents a fibrous uh, anastomosis between the two separate orifices of the valve. Ah, oh, look at that. It's plain. All right. Well, you be the judge, Girish. I think it looks great. Thank you. And here's a patient at surgery with a true double orifice with a reduplication. And in addition, with caudal attachment of this anterior uh, orifice to the uh, crest of the septum, suggesting, in fact, and in fact you can see it here on the echo, there looks like there's a cleft in the anterior mitral valve. So double orifice with a cleft of the anterior leaflet. Um, it's usually in a, in a partial AV canal when that happens. Yeah, I don't think this was an AV canal though. And then this is a patient who had an ASD, has got Cortra atriatum dexter, very beautiful uh, uh, eustachian valve, which is what Cortra atriatum dexter is. And then here you can see two orifices with a little fibrous bridge, and you can see separate flow from the, the two orifices uh, coming into the left ventricle. So that's the other form of double orifice mitral valve. Uh, and this is a double orifice, and I think this is reminiscent of what Dr. Sanders showed you. Uh, two orifices to the mitral valve seen here in short axis. One there, and one there with color going through separately in each one, and a supravalvar ring as well. And this is a patient with double outlet right ventricle and a very lousy mitral valve. Lousy is a, a slang word in English for bad. Named after a louse. There's the other orifice. And then I got this from uh, my friend Daniel Seedy from a paper he published uh, with Pascal Voyer in the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery based on cleft mitral valves. And this looking at the cleft in a mi isolated cleft in a mitral valve uh, from the surgeon's point of view. Um, Surgeons are actually very simple folks, you know, and, but very honest. They have to know exactly what they're dealing with. Yeah, I can see if you also like them, right. But um, they, they really have to know exactly what they're dealing with, and they, they'll fix what they see. Uh, I think it's better to look at a cleft valve from below so you can see the tendinous cord attachment uh, 
But that's not what the surgeons are ever going to see. We see that when we look at it at autopsy. Yeah, but just like a TV echo. It does, but it doesn't move. <laughs> It does. Well, anyway, that's, that's an example of a cleft valve. And the, the thing that uh, Adriana Gittenberger de Groot uh, mentioned about uh, uh, these cleft valves is that this is probably a form thrust of a developmental abnormality of the AV canal. And as such, there are tenderness cords which have a... You don't agree? Of course it is. Okay. Oh, you agree. Phew. Just excuse me a minute. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but you can see the caudal attachment to the crest of the septum, and my thrust about the diagnosis of cleft mitral valves is almost always you will be able to see the caudal attachment of the mitral valve to the cleft of the septum, and as you know, there aren't always. I, I said almost always. Didn't you hear me say that? No. Can you guys take a, while, a walk while I'm giving this presentation? <laughs> if you are, somebody does. <laughs> I said almost always, so you're not paying attention. So now, as far as the, um, the, uh, the, the papillary muscles are around, in an AV canal, the uh, cords are, uh, the, the papillary muscles which support the commissures are rotated around. In an isolated cleft, they really are not rotated around. The mural leaflet is often quite large in this condition. And there's a caudal cleft or, uh, with tendons which usually goes uh, in a different direction in uh, uh, what we did is we looked at a whole series of these patients and looked at where the cleft was. We took this as a zero point and with a goniometer measured uh, degrees for the uh, attachment, found that uh, clefts with AV canals were always in this region, but clefts of a mitral valve associated with other congenital heart disease or isolated had a different kind of direction of the attachment. So um, I'll show you a few clefts. Um, sometimes not so easy to recognize. This actually is a patient with tricuspid atresia and cleft mitral valve. The cleft and cordy tendony always go towards the direction of the septum. Sometimes they even go through the defect and attach on the other side or, or, or to the right ventricular musculature. But here you can see the caudal uh, uh, cleft here is really way over from the place we normally see it in association with AV canal defects. Here's almost another little papillary muscle on the uh, septal surface to which uh, the valve is attaching. So three leaflets. And I can turn that to be like the picture. Now this is the next uh, uh, orifice abnormality. This is a patient with a cleft in the mitral valve associated with the ventricular septal defect. So the tendinous cords of this leaflet are attached to the cleft surrounding the ventricular septal defect. And here in the left ventricular outflow tract, the aorta is up here, is this cute little balloon structure with a separate little ring of tendinous cords in it, which is part of an accessory mitral valve leaflet. And these can often cause uh, a, a severe subaortic obstruction. And you can see the velocity gradient appearing at the point where this is attaching to the septum. If you didn't like it in the long axis, here it is in a four-chamber view. Here it is in the short axis view. And here it is on the subcostal coronal or sub long axis view. And here you can see the valve, uh, the, the accessory orifice almost prolapsing through the aortic leaflets as you're looking at it from above. See that? You see the aortic valve leaflets when they're closed, and when it's open you see a circle, which is the dome of that accessory tissue, which is presenting in the orifice of the valve. And if you think that was a lie, here is that same patient at surgery, and we're looking at the open aorta, uh, while the patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass and the surgeon has put in these sutures to keep the valve, uh, that accessory orifice, and is going to simply, as, as uh, Steve Sanders says, scrape it off the valve. And here's the transesophageal echo, which shows this little uh, redundancy immediately below the aortic valve leaflets. 
Well, uh, mitral regurgitation, Mark, did you want to say something about this? I, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, you, we have a variety of mitral valve regurgitation. Well, I have prepared a short one okay. function this time. There's no time that's All right, right, well, I'll let you talk about it then, if you've got it ready. Okay, we, I've, I've decided that uh, straddling valves we will, will not discuss. Now, subaortic stenosis, there are a variety of kinds and a variety of positions of the membrane. And Tal Gaver, again, who we've evoked many times, spent a lot of uh, time talking about and looking and trying to understand subaortic membranes. And the kind of subaortic membrane you're likely to miss is the kind that I show in the first picture here. Can you see the subaortic membrane? It's actually attached to the underside of the aortic valve. And I, I have had experiences where I've not been able to recognize this before the patient has gone for a balloon valvuloplasty. And you take this patient for a balloon valvuloplasty and they fail to do anything to the valve. And then you come and look and you say, yes, indeed, it's subaortic stenosis and the, the membrane is adherent to the underside of the aortic valve cusps. And actually what Dr. Tull uh, had said was that the closer the membrane gets to the aortic valve, the more the aortic valve damage, and also the more likely the patient is to require a surgical procedure. And then here's the ubiquitous finding uh, with color flow in the same patient of aortic insufficiency. The membrane damages the valve leaflet. It may interfere with valve function, and so you get aortic insufficiency. In this patient, the membrane is a little distal to uh, the uh, first example, and in this example here, it's quite a lot distal. It was interesting to look at Dr. Sanders's picture because uh, the, 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 the pathology, when you looked at that ridge there, that ridge was actually on the VSD side, of, uh, on, the, on the ventricular side of the VSD. There was no VSD in that patient. There wasn't. Because oh. all the ones I've seen with, yeah. There was no VSD there? No. Okay. But it was quite distal from the valve. It was a long from yeah. the valve. But the ones I've seen with VSD are all are usually proximal. They're on the on the septal on the apical side of the VSD. On the apical side, yeah. yes. Not on the right. Not on the that's not right. Not on the aortic valve no. side. Only only posterior malalignment of the inventive receptor. Yes. Like right. Well we've seen that. I'm not going to be talking about this, but here's a subcostal view showing the same thing. Um, and you can see uh, there's really quite some distance uh, between the uh, uh, aortic valve and the membrane. But the other thing that's important when you look at this, and I didn't bring any pathology of these subaortic membranes, they're really quite intriguing to look at uh, pathologically, but you can see clearly that this is attached to the anterior mitral valve leaflet, and it attaches to the outflow tract much like a semilunar signal with a thick piece on the septum and then it comes round and attaches onto the, uh, the uh, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve as well. And uh, being a somewhat cautious person and somewhat old and sentimental, I have shown you a picture of a subaortic membrane in still frame from long axis and apical four chamber view, apical five chamber view with acceleration of flow at the proximal end of the membrane and also this characteristic and classical feature uh, of um, a, the early closure associated with a membrane. Now the difference between IHSS type of flutter on the valve and flutter related to the membrane is because the membrane is a fixed structure. As the hydraulic forces tend to force the membrane towards the aortic valve, it opens the aortic valve very beautifully as you see there. But then as soon as the aortic valve is open, the membrane then acts as a brake on the velocity and the valve then moves into the closed position in a very early order and then is associated with flutter related to the turbulence created across the membrane. And so in, uh, when you see this kind of signal, as opposed to the signal in subaortic stenosis due to IHSS, the early closure is really within the first 60 milliseconds of the aortic valve opening. And it may not be important to you, but it was once important to a mother whose child died with subaortic stenosis and the uh, cardiologist had recorded this kind of signal and had thought it was a ventricular septal defect. But the records were there and the uh, 
uh, doctor actually had to settle a large amount of money with the uh, family of the deceased child. And on autopsy, which was done by a diligent coroner, there was a classical subaortic membrane. Okay, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about Doppler. It's a wonderful technique. It's easy to do. And when you see uh, obstruction across a membrane that looks like this, either from the suprasternal or the subcostal region, you know you're dealing with severe uh, uh, subaortic stenosis. Now, the one thing that seems to be interesting about the biology of membranes is that um, if you look at a cross-sectional study, as I did with histology, uh, that the ground substance is really a net. When you look at it on histology, it looks like a straight wavy line and there's no um, uh, opportunity for cells to pass between the membrane. But uh, in some point in um, the history, the natural history of these diseases, sometimes the cells start to migrate, the fibrous tissue starts to migrate through the basement membrane and come up uh, underneath the membrane and then instead of seeing a true membranous structure, you start to see what this we call this candle waxing. Here is an example of somebody, this is an left ventricular outflow tract, and it appears that somebody has dropped candle wax on the outflow tract. That's really a proliferation of fibrous tissue within the outflow tract. So uh, you, uh, one of the things about subaortic stenosis is it's probably a dynamic condition. It probably uh, develops sometime when there's, um, for, for reasons that are not clear, I've seen it as early as two weeks in an autopsy specimen uh, in association with ventricular septal defects. And it's dynamic and it can progress through life. So I think that it's something that requires constant evaluation, even, even if uh, it looks fairly stable and is small in a young child. Uh, uh, here's an example of a patient who had double-chambered right ventricle. In double-chambered right ventricle, there's frequently subaortic stenosis. And here is exactly the example of the difference between a membranous aortic stenosis with early closure and what happens on the pulmonary valve with late closure and reopening here that's related to a muscular obstruction within the right ventricular outflow tract. So right ventricular outflow tract with mid-systolic closure and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction due to membrane with early systolic closure, and both with flutter related to the proximal turbulence. Okay. Now, I'm getting to the end of this. This is a membrane of, I um, uh, uh, beg your pardon, this is a patient that had a, a mitral valve replacement. You can see the stent here, even though it was placed in the supravalvar annular position, has enlarged and come into the outflow tract. And uh, although this patient didn't have anything before surgery, immediately after surgery, you can see the stent of this prosthetic, bioprosthetic valve coming into the right ventricle and obstructing uh, the right ventricular outflow tract. And here's again the turbulent flow with color flow signal and a Doppler signal recorded here in the ascending aorta, uh, still showing some acceleration, but it, trying to get a decent angle. So this patient went back on bypass and had the valve replaced, and that was uh, successfully done, and the uh, LV alpha tract gradient disappeared. Now, uh, very ever so often in patients with AV canal defects, this is a patient with an AV canal defect, there is elongation of the outflow tract, and here's a patient with subaortic stenosis who's undergone an annuloplasty of the mitral valve as part of an AV uh, septal defect repair, and who has a long, narrow outflow tract, uh, which is uh, also uh, insufficient as well, and this patient underwent a conotype uh, repair of the LV outflow tract. So, uh, what else causes obstruction? This is a rhabdomyoma associated with tuberous sclerosis, and this patient has got clearly a uh, prolapse of the structure uh, through the aortic valve leaflet. You can see it here, going right through the aortic valve leaflet. Uh, and uh, the question is, what do you do with a patient like that? And the answer is that we did nothing about it because we know this is an early uh, postnatal study that um, 
the uh, rhabdomyomas are under the influence of, uh, uh, of estrogens, and they're a little bit more vascular, and then as they lose their vascular supply, they become fibrous, and within months to years, they will either shrivel up uh, or get substantially smaller so they don't cause a problem. And this patient has been followed for a long period of time now. The uh, mass has gotten substantially smaller and more fibrous, not interfering with valve leaflets, but initially did cause subaortic uh, obstruction. And now, not only does that occur, but I've seen even when it happens in utero that you can get obstruction to the LV alpha tract and start getting left ventricular dysfunction as a chronic long-term uh, problem. Thanks for your attention.